ready for takeoff. Good morning, good morning. I hope y'all are having a great RubyConf. Are you guys having a good time? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's been a great conference for me as well. Um, my name is Kelly Ryan, and I'm here to talk about working together. About me, um, I transitioned from teaching in 2020 after doing um, a self-guided boot camp for about a year. I'm currently a junior developer at Power Home Remodeling, which is a company located near Philly that installs windows, roofs, and doors. Uh, I work on their ERP software. Uh, initially, I was hired as an engineer on the UX team, but now I do both back-end and front-end feature work, um, working in Ruby and JavaScript. And like many of you, I'm a career changer. I taught Latin and Greek for 13 years to high schoolers, so 14 to 18-year-olds in a couple different schools, and I have an MA in Latin. Um, because of my long career in education and my extensive experience working with probably about 1,000 teenagers and their parents, I have a unique passion and perspective on how people should work together to maximize learning and potential. I don't have a lot of social media, um, but my email and LinkedIn are above, and that is a picture of me at Cervetri, which is this uh, large tomb complex in Italy. It looks like it should be where the hobbits live. It was really amazing. All right, I decided to present on this for a bunch of reasons. I'm really excited about learning, and I have a lot of experience helping people learn. But first is the ubiquity of the experience, so how commonplace it is. Um, how many people here pair on a daily basis or a weekly basis at their job? Yeah. And how many people have struggled at some point with pairing? Yeah. And how many people have had specific training in best pairing? Oh, good, there's some people. That's excellent. Uh, there are a lot of difficult things about pairing, um, especially if you're less experienced like I am. Maybe you've had trouble just getting someone to pair with you, or once you're in the middle of an interaction, maybe you find that you're at a loss as to how to proceed. Where I work, uh, we've got a ton of less experienced developers because we have an education system at work where we take people from throughout the business and train them up in-house. And what this means is that we have a lot of people with a less understanding of what is expected from junior developers and less experience in the world of tech altogether. They need to pair daily and often for much of the day, so a clear idea of expectations is essential for them to be successful. The second thing is that it's worth the investment. So the ubiquity, the commonplaceness would make it enough to be worth it, but we all, no matter how skilled, need help teaching and learning. Um, our profession is, after all, about learning new skills. But it's also just worth the investment in general. Uh, according to a study on employer-provided training, 70% of professional learning can be done up informally. And for us, informal learning often means pairing. Um, and that means that good pairing practices are essential to moving our employees and our companies forward. So deliberate thought and training about best pairing is very much worth the investment. Despite this, um, although a few of you seem to have got, had specific training in pairing or working together, there still is, a, um, I guess, a dearth of, of training. Lastly, I think that small changes can equal great gains. Um, with practical advice can come behavioral changes that will make a real difference in people's experiences pairing. So this presentation um, here is not, it's not here to provide you with a template for how you should be like more empathetic or patient or something like that, but more for what things you can do to make pairing experiences better, whether you're in a senior or a junior developer role. Additionally, the, the talk is structured so you can pull one or two things from it, whatever you think will be most useful. There's no reason for you to do all the things that I am saying, so please don't feel overwhelmed by the amount of things that I suggest. Each one of my points should stand as a, on its own as valuable and then hopefully easy to implement. Um, and since this is a lecture, I'm gonna do this as directly as possible so there won't be any fluff, just a decent lesson plan with that conveys and reviews information. So let's go. The talk will be divided into three parts, before, during, and after pairing. Before pairing in particular, there are I think, some ways you can set yourself up for success. And this section will focus on you as your role as a less experienced developer. As I was just mentioning, during pairing, there are behaviors that can help improve the experience pairing for all developers. Um, this section will focus on more as you as a more experienced developer. And then after pairing, we're gonna look at things that you can do to solidify your learning and build your relationships. I'm going to use the words junior and senior in a looser, more expansive sense. So a junior in this presentation is someone with experience, uh, less experience, and it can be like years of experience, it could be knowledge, it could be domain, ideas, some sort of technology. 
But, um, and this means that sometimes a junior can be more experienced and do the work of a senior developer and vice versa. So hopefully we're all a potential audience for this talk because we all play these roles at some time or another. So a junior developer is one with less experience in a domain, technology, or idea, and a senior is one with more. As I move through the talk, as I mentioned, I will shift my focus from junior to senior and then back again, because all of us have these roles to play. Hopefully everything will seem relevant and salient. Before pairing. So when I first started coding, I expected everyone to be smarter and more intuitive than me, which was pretty much true. But I also thought it meant that I could give people very little information and they'd be able to solve my problem. Maybe you've had this experience with um, less experienced devs. I would ping someone with questions like, really specific questions like, hey, I have a question about users. Do you have a minute? Or something like, can anyone help? I'm stuck on something. And I usually wouldn't get a response. And I was a little upset. I knew my question was easy and that they could answer it right away, but no one was responding. This was, of course, my fault. I needed to frame my questions in a way that would allow potential helpers, i.e. more experienced developers, a better idea of what my problem was and whether they had the ability and time to help. The point of this is to set yourself up for a good pairing session. You need to provide information to the person with whom you are pairing so that they can help you in the best way possible. When you do this, you're helping yourself as well as your potential partner. Uh, first, I would suggest that you be upfront about your expectations for the pairing session. There's a lot of reasons why you might want to pair. Oftentimes, when I was first starting out and I was a little lost, I would come up with a plan for my PR, then ask my lead dev to meet with me so I could show him what I was intending. And then this would, this, I did this to make sure that he was sure of my general direction. And then before each pairing session, I would let him know that's what I wanted. I wanted to review my plan. That way, he understood the general parameters of our session, and this helped him know how long it would take and what would be expected. Other potential reasons are rubber ducking, so articulating a problem for another dev as an aid to debugging, general interest in the PR for background knowledge, or um, just general help when blocked. I'm going to gear my next points towards getting help needing, hmm, excuse me, towards people needing help getting unblocked because that is what most people think of as pairing, and that is where much of the urgency and the difficulty can lie. When blocked, there are ways of asking for help, I think, ways of structuring questions that provide background information to the more experienced devs so you can have a really productive pairing session. So I wanna go through a well-structured, well-documented question and break it apart so that in the future, you'll have a better chance of getting help quickly and for that help to be exactly what you need. This will be the main part of the section, and I think if you have any takeaways from this talk, I would say this would help you the most because this helps you learn, as well as allows people to see you as a person who can ask good questions, which is super important. This means people will be more willing to help you. So some poorly structured questions. I have a question, can you help? My user title PR isn't working and I'm stuck. Do you have time? And I, even I have a PR working on user titles and compensation amounts, do you think you could help me? These are all insufficiently precise questions because they actually produce more questions, including two initial fundamental questions that need to be answered. What is the problem and what is the desired outcome or expected behavior? So my first tip would be to summarize your problem and write out a brief version of what you want to happen. What is happening and what is it that you want to happen? I need some help with a PR that should change the default compensation amount for a user title. The compensation value is not changing. This question, by contrast, or statement, by contrast, lets the other developers know the problem that you are working on and the desired outcome and be expected behavior for the PR. This is the minimum you should provide when you're asking for help. What else do we need, though? What else would be most helpful for another developer to have con access to? Context. I would, I, my next suggestion would be to expand on your issue with context. Accessible code references, URLs, et cetera. I've tried changing the compensation amount and then checking it on the career change page, but it's not changing. I've pushed up what I've done so far. I've been working with the career change page and the user title mutation. Here's the story card. Context is anything that might help another developer get a more expansive view of the problem. Context helps the more experienced dev find all the pieces of your PR and gathers them together in one place. Notice all the links above. In providing links to relevant information, you provide information that could be used by the senior dev to solve your problem. Your context helps answer the questions, what have you done so far? What code are you working with? And what more precisely are the goals of the PR? 
At this point, you should have given the more experienced dev the overall basic goal of your PR, but especially for more complex work, it is always good to provide the story so that the goals can be gone over in more details. In fact, all these questions are less necessary for less complex work and absolutely necessary for your larger PRs. Pushing over PR, for example, that where you only change one file might not be super useful. But if you have larger, more complex code changes, it can save a lot of time pairing if you push up your work, even if the code is less than perfect, which is a hard thing to do, I think. Um, and the more experienced developer will be appreciate being able to toggle from one file to another and compare changes in a format she's familiar with. She'll get a better idea more quickly what the idea might be and how to fix it. Lastly, and um, it's sometimes it's good to supply outside information. This is in particular good so that you can let the experience know the urgency with which the problem needs to be approached. So if a support ticket was opened two weeks ago, it might be prudent to look at this, um, to get help and look at it right away because two weeks is a long time to leave something unaddressed. And it can also be a catch-all for any other ideas or info you might have. So in thinking or considering whether your question is well-structured or well-documented, you can ask yourself, does my question summarize? Does it contextualize and does it supply outside information? Once you have someone who's agreed to help you, uh, my next preparing suggestion would be to look at your level of preparation. Preparing saves time and frustration. Um, it shows respect for time and effort and it encourages others to be more willing to pair again. I think that we've all had these experiences where we've started to pair with somebody and they haven't had their server up or, um, or maybe they haven't had things, they just haven't had things ready so you have to wait while you're pairing. It's really best to be prepared for an interaction in so far as is possible. Like obviously sometimes you'll need to restart your server or maybe set up data again. And this is normal in the course of pairing, but in so far as is possible, make sure you're prepared. My first suggestion would be to create a basic plan. And this seems like a lot, um, but it can be really simple. For example, just reading over the story card together, um, quickly to review problem and expected behavior, showing the current behavior, and then looking at the relevant code. This is a simple, easy plan that makes sure the person you're working with understands the background and the current situation. It doesn't have to be complex or difficult, although the difficulty will scale as your PR gets more complex. But by doing this, it will help you organize your approach to the problem and get things ready for your pairing session. Uh, my next point would be to ease pain points in testing and reviewing. For me, I work in an HR component, and I often need to be logged in as two users in two different states in two separate browsers to test my PRs. And that can take a bit of time and organization to set up. I should set this up before meeting with my partner. Setting it up would be an easy way that I can prepare to make it quicker and much less frustrating for them. Other examples, sometimes you may need to set up data in a specific way or see different examples of a UI in quick succession, or maybe your server takes 10 minutes at a time to pull up. My webpack takes like 12 to 15 minutes. Um, and all these are ways that can make things quicker and make sure you're more prepared for your interaction. Lastly, um, make sure all work is readily available. Now this is a bit of a repeat. If you've created a well-structured, well-documented question, you may have already done this, but it really bears repeating. Providing links in the relevant files is essential and especially if it's a more complex PR, pushing up your work to GitHub is extremely helpful. Every senior developer I talked to about this said that it's so helpful for them if they can see things up, um, pushed up on GitHub. And I was always so reluctant to do so. Um, otherwise, providing links to the relevant code, having correct functions marked and ready will help make, pair make pairing go more smoothly. So some questions. Have I created a plan? Have I prepared my environment? And have I provided good context? Once developers are set up and pairing, there are ways of communicating that are more effective and have been proven to improve performance, learning, and collaboration. This section focuses on you and your role as a more experienced dev. So again, more experienced dev means someone who's, who understands more about a domain, technology, or idea. The first is to teach and pair by asking questions. Question asking isn't just good practice for a junior developer, but it's really good practice for a senior developer as well. It's almost always better to ask a question and lead someone to an answer rather than to tell them the answer. There are, of course, times when things need to be fixed really quickly, like if production is broken. It might be better to tell someone what to do. But on average, I think that it's best to ask. Questions increase engagement. The developer with less experience is encouraged to let you know what they do and do not know so you can better proceed. 
Questions reveal assumptions and gaps in knowledge. There are often gaps in developers' knowledge, in all of our knowledge, places where our studying hasn't been as thorough. And these are blocking our way to being successful. If you're working with someone um, and they're asking you good questions, then you can find and fill these gaps and make more progress. And posing authentic questions really can make unclear points clear and reveal assumptions that otherwise would have main, remained unearthed. They don't even have to be profound or difficult. You could say, what could we try next? Why should we do it this way? Where is the code that tells us this? How do we know this? And if we try this, what would happen? If they don't have the answers, this tells you something as well. Either they don't know the answers or they don't know how to speak about the answers, which is sometimes the case, right? Maybe they, they know what's going on, but they don't know how to talk about it. And then you have a clear direction as to how to proceed. My next suggestion would be to be very deliberate about creating a partnership as you develop rather than using a top-down approach. There are obvious benefits to this, not the least of which by coding together as partners, you build better personal and professional relationships. But I told you I would provide you with practical ideas, not just saying, be a good partner. Um, so I have a few suggestions that I think hopefully will be decently easy to implement. So I would suggest leveraging the power of language. Using first plural and conditional language could, should, would, it sounds like a trick. Like it's simple, too simple and negligible to work um, in building a partnership. But a study of, study of event racing, I don't know if you guys know what event racing is. They drop four people in the wilderness and then they're told to go find something and they're given a GPS and they canoe and they climb. But a study of adventure racing showed that the more conditional rather than assertive language that those four people used with one another, the more successful their team was across the board. So this is an actual thing and it's super easy for anyone to implement. Another easy way to build a partnership and to make sure ideas are clear to both sides is to summarize the points made by your partner. Um, this can be as easy as repeating the last thing your partner said in your own words, what I'm hearing you say is, uh, so that you can get an affirmation and make sure you're both on the same page. If your partner's ideas are unclear or just nascent, it's a good idea to encourage them to expand on their points. Could you help me understand so that you can better understand where they are going and what they intend to do next? This is especially true if you think they're on the wrong track so that you can expose any wrong assumptions or gaps in their knowledge. Lastly, suggesting rather than telling can improve your partnership. We have all had experiences with this. Perhaps our children or our partners respond better to gentle suggestion rather than direct orders. And it's always easier for me to do what someone wants if they tell it to me in the form of a suggestion, giving me choice. You're aiming for cooperation and openness rather than obedience. In summary, the more you can share knowledge and direction that is a perspective that is provisional, revisable, and conditional, the better your partnership is gonna be across the board. My final general advice during pairing is to focus on debugging and tools for the less, providing debug, um, debugging and providing tools for the less experienced developer. So this is self-explanatory, I think, um, and backed by Proverbs, to sort of give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day, teach a man fish, and you will feed him for a lifetime. By providing tools to the junior developer, you give them a better chance to solve the next problem on their own. And if you can focus on more than one tool during your debugging, you are also showing the less experienced developer how to approach, approach a problem from different angles. This allows them to make more connections and gives them a more complete picture of the issue at hand. And the tools really don't have to be complex. They could be whatever you would do in the course of debugging a problem. Um, there's no need for you to come up with lesson plans or for you to even really plan ahead. You use tools throughout your day um, to solve problems. So focusing on showing those tools and the use and benefit of them should be easy. Tools include um, Rails and browser consoles. Um, the network tab for me has been particularly useful and I didn't know about it till someone showed me. Whatever error gathering tools you have, logs, binding pry, buy bugs, sandbox, plugins, shortcuts, anything that you find useful as you debug a problem. It's really worth the extra effort to show the junior in a complete way how to use a, a tool because you're investing in that junior's and your own future. The more you level them up, the less help they'll need and the more productive your team can become. So during pairing, you can ask yourself, am I asking questions? Am I using conditional language? Am I summarizing um, what the other person is saying? Am I suggesting rather than telling? And am I focusing on debugging and tools? After pairing. 
the first thing I would suggest would be reflection. Knowledge and skill, this is really important. Knowledge and skills are not just developed through direct experience, but also through reflection on direct experience. For many companies, this is done through postmortems, especially if something's gone really, really wrong, um, or perhaps through weekly retros, in which the team comes together to discuss how the week went and how it can get better the next. But this can also be a part of pairing. I would suggest that at the end of each pairing session, you tell your partner at least one thing that you learned from the interaction. This reinforces learning because you're putting into words what you've learned, making it more memorable and more relevant in your mind. It doesn't really have to be anything profound. It could be a new tool or method, a new way to think about a problem, a vocabulary word. It could be anything at all. This also shows your partner, and super satisfying, I think, for the person that you're working with. It shows them that you were engaged and listening while they helped you. Everyone likes to feel like they've had an impact, and everyone likes to be heard. In showing them that you listen carefully, you are encouraging them to see you in a positive light and increasing the chance they want, will work with you later. Uh, this flows nicely into my next point, which is, of course, gratitude. Uh, thanking someone who helped you is the right thing to do, and by thanking someone with specific feedback, i.e. what you've learned, you make your gratitude clear. Sincere gratitude, it shows that you know the value of someone's work and time, and it helps build your relationships, and it's an easy way to give back to someone who's given you something positive and useful. After pairing, um, have I given specific positive feedback, and have I thanked my partner? So I'm next, I'm just gonna review the things that I went over, and, um, and that'll be that. So major takeaways. I think in this talk, I made a case for the essential nature of pairing. Most of us do it on a daily basis, but most of us haven't had specific training and teaching or learning that will enable us to get the most out of the experience. I argued there were small changes we could make in our everyday behavior and interactions that would improve our learning and lead to better personal and professional relationships. Before pairing, I made what I think is my most important argument, which is to create questions that are well-structured and well-documented. Often if you do these and you, you create these questions, you answer your, your questions yourself. So this is really, really important. It really helps you learn. Um, uh, this, along with good preparation, will promote quicker, better pairing sessions overall. During pairing, I mentioned using collaborative words, focusing on we and us as conditional, revisable language. And I also encouraged a focus on thoroughly explaining the tools being used to solve the problem. Lastly, I encourage you to reflect on learning by giving feedback to your partner about what you've learned. Again, learning is not just done by experience, but by reflecting on experience. And this specific feedback in turn feeds into gratitude for the help and patience that you've received. Thank you so much for your attention and for attending my talk. Um, I would challenge you to take maybe one or two things from the talk and see if you can incorporate them in your next experience pairing and see if, I don't know, how it feels or what, whether it helps you. I really hope it's been helpful and I hope you have a wonderful time at RubyConf and that you learn a lot and that you have a wonderful holiday season. Um, thanks to Valerie Willard, Garrett Airwood, and Gabrielle Ferreira who helped me with this talk and listened to me give it for the first time and second time and fourth time. So <laughs> thank you very much.